amen and happy Mother's Day again. I want to, before we get really started today, I wanted to say a public thank you to Pastor Gary for handling service last week. Um, you may or may not have known he is actually planning on handling it before I got the news that I was going to have to go out of town Sunday morning early to preach a funeral in Texas on Monday night for my 51-year-old cousin. When are they going to stop? But I'm thankful, extremely thankful for a staff and a church who understands and supports and encourages and prays and for a pastor who's going to get up and fill the void. Because what you may not have realized is Pastor Gary got a double whammy, a triple whammy. Last week, if you were here, I turned it on kind of late after landing, and, and I was like, man, he's already starting his message, and it's early. And then I found out that, that Brother Tony had an emergency and had to go out of town, and then he woke up to Shane and Katie having a problem Sunday morning at their home that they had to deal with some stuff. And so Pastor Gary, uh, from what I understood, un- turned, or Jason bailed him out and muted him, and he led worship for a couple of songs. And, and, uh, and then we, he preached a phenomenal word on an extremely difficult text and uh when he asked me about preaching the text I said he says I said look you're more than welcome to come out of Corinthians and do your own thing or he's like no no I think as a church we need to stay in what God's doing and so Pastor Gary thank you Uh, that's all I can say is thank you And it, it kind of leads us into this idea of all. That is the title for today's message in our series, Seeing Life Through the, Gospel, through the Lens of the Gospel, and our Integrity series here, All. Because do we truly, when we sing that song and we read those words, do we truly surrender all? I mean, that's a big word. Commitment is a very big word. It is a strong word. And I don't know about you, but when you start thinking about the word commitment, how does it make you feel? When you decide to do something, I, I got to thinking today about a farmer's illustration. Some of you around here uh, like to plant vegetables. I, I'm still trying to figure out this whole thing of planting all these vegetables you can't eat that you have to can and then you put on your shelves that last for years, and then you do it again every year. But I, I, I don't know what that says that, about you if you're just that well prepared and I'm that lazy or what. But uh, I, I just go to the grocery store. But I got to thinking about it, though, and the idea of a commitment to be a farmer, I mean, you have to prepare for this. This isn't that you just get up one day and say, I'm going to go plant a bunch of seeds. You have to prepare. You have to have a lot of forethought. You have to think through this commitment of planting a garden. And then there comes the work. You have to get out and prep the soil and fertilize and plant, and then you can maybe wait for a little bit, but it's not long, and then all of a sudden the work continues. You have to harvest all of this stuff. And then what you guys say is you have to can all this. I've, under, I've never understood how canning is done in jars, but that's another question you guys can come talk to me about later. Um, but it's a big commitment. But then there's a third part of commitment, isn't there? Cleaning it all up. Putting it all away. Preparing and fixing and repairing your tractors and fixing all the utensils you do and cleaning up from all the canning and, and stuff that you do from harvesting. I mean, this idea of commitment is a big one. I'm really good when I make a decision and to do something, to commit to something, to do in two of the three. I'm not real good with the last one. Um, If you want to know, just come look at my garage and you will see how I just throw the tools back in. And sometimes if they make it to the toolbox, great. If not, I have a little bag there, I throw them in. But but you never can find that dreadful 10 millimeter wrench. (laughs) For you that deal with wrenches, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But commitment requires that we be all in, doesn't it? E- even to the cleanup of things. And, and listen, what I, what I want to tell you today, and for you that, don't, that aren't here on a weekly basis that you're visiting with your moms, I want to thank you for coming and spending time with your moms. I want to tell you that you're caught in the middle of a series here, um, that, and we preach through books of the Bible at a time here, so just know you're having to catch a section of, of Scripture that uh, is pretty, pretty difficult to preach. But it's one that I think we need to hear because when we give our lives to Christ it's a commitment isn't it it's an all-in commitment it requires much of us it requires a walk that pursues God I want you to understand this and I wrote this down the gospel 
is not a one-time decision. The gospel is a lifetime decision. The, the gospel makes us right with God, but then it propels us into the pursuit of God. It is an ongoing commitment that we have with the Lord. I believe we've gotten it wrong in the church in the West for far too long. We preach this idea that we just need to share the gospel like it's evangelism, get somebody saved, and then we just say, good luck. That's not the gospel. The gospel is an ongoing, sold-out commitment to Jesus Christ for what he did for you. That is the gospel, and that is what matters. And here we're going to see that, that the Greeks, according to Paul in the church of Corinth, were having a hard time being committed to all of who Jesus was. Was And he is going to address them on the errors of their way. You see, they wanted salvation. Tell me if you've ever heard this before or experienced this before. They wanted all that heaven had to give through salvation. But then they wanted to live like the world. They were saved. They, 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 Paul's been preaching this gospel of liberty and freedom. And they, so therefore they can do whatever they want inside the body because it's going to die someday. And so they wanted it all. They wanted all of heaven but wanted to continue to live like they do. I, I think that happens today too, doesn't it? That is my story. As somebody in my late 20s who thought I was saved and then realized, no, I have knowledge of Jesus, but I don't have a relationship. I don't have this commitment to Jesus. I wanted all that heaven had to offer while I justified living the way I live. But see, I think the truth is this. I think the truth is that a saved person will give evidence of their salvation by the way in which they live. They'll be committed to what Christ did for them. They will count the cost. They will understand what sacrifice Jesus made and will begin to live in such a way that honors him. It may take a little time. We call that sanctification, but we should be able to see the evidence of somebody becoming like Christ throughout their whole life. They will not continue to live in a sinful lifestyle. They will denounce it and fight against it. That is what a true believer would do. So if you would turn with me, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we will be in verse 12. We'll in, read through the end of the chapter. If you could stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. And I pray today, God, that your grace and your mercy would go forth, that you would give me the wisdom to preach this message. And God, help us to all learn and take away that it is all sin that you have a problem with and that we should pursue holiness. So God, may you be glorified. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of things that as I was studying the text today and I was thinking about the Greek lifestyle and you've heard us preach on that over the last several weeks and how they indulged in their own selfful, selfish, sinful lifestyle how they tried to bring the greek religion into christianity i'm not, I'm not going to get into all of that today but as i was reading the text and i and i came across the word there starting in verse 12 all which is why i entitled this message all because we tend to think like the greeks did all things are lawful for me but then i started realizing and i started highlighting in my bible and if you've got a pen or a highlighter there's a three-letter word that i think is powerful it's small but it's a powerful word, and it's this word, but. B-U-T. 
So if you've got a highlighter, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, or if you're one of those, I, I would tell you to look everywhere you see in this text from 12 to 20, underline, highlight that word, but. Because Paul, if he's trying to do here is correct some false teaching, some false understanding of what he had been saying. Paul has been teaching that in Christ we are free. Galatians 5.1, for, for, for freedom you've been set free. Well, the Greeks were taking this to the extreme. If we're then free and we have liberty because Christ has saved us, then we can continue to live in this certain way. And so what Paul is actually doing here, how many of you heard that this, this verse said before, but all things are permissible for me. How many of you have heard that? And you, and you think you're running around thinking, but I can do anything I want through Christ. He, he saved me. I, I'm free. Paul said it. What you've got to understand is Paul is not saying it. Paul's quoting the Greeks. The Greeks are saying that all things are permissible. And he's saying, okay, if you think all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. This word, but, is a big, powerful word. Because you need to understand that what Paul was saying about freedom and liberty found in Christ is that it brings us freedom over sin. It's not a green light to continue to go on in sin. The death of Jesus Christ has secured us and has sealed us. But Paul wants it, us to know that it requires something of us. And so he corrects their thinking by adding this small yet powerful word, but. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body's not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. But is a small yet powerful word word so you see the greeks they were using their freedom the wrong way weren't they they were trying to say that this freedom gives them this liberty gives them the ability to do what they want inside their body and paul said no this is the wrong idea the pursuit that you should have should be one that leads you to holiness you're going to see in a moment why i think this is a big deal but it should pursue them to live a life of holiness not justify sinful behavior i think you have to ask yourself at some point in time as a believer have you ever used this verse to justify sinful behavior in your own life i think all of us to some degree have at some point in time when we're when we as believers we're battling conviction in our life we are all battling this but it's permissible god you said it's okay for me to do this or, or by your sacrifice and your blood washing and making me whole, well, then I can do this. We, we all battle this at some point in time, whether we should justify it or not. But I can just tell you this. If it's going to cause you to be dominated by something other than Jesus, you ought to not do it. Your pursuit ought to be holiness. And so Paul corrects this behavior in them. And, and I, I'm telling you, I think the attitude still exists today. I mean, look at where we are as a society. Look at where we are as a country and what we're being allowed to, to, to ask to accept. And when we don't accept things, we get told that we're wrong and we're judgmental. I, I can remember a day where when you turned the TV on, you didn't have to worry about hearing foul language and nudity. Now you can't even watch public TV, regular TV stations without seeing nudity and listening to foul words. And we're, we're supposed to accept that and say that that kind of stuff is okay and i just think that's one small issue that exists but it still exists today jerry and i on our cruise we went and listened to the comedian pg and he said well he wasn't that bad so maybe he'll be a little better tonight so we went to the earlier of the late shows we had to leave it was nasty can we justify it that oh well we don't talk like that we don't do this kind of stuff can we justify it no you cannot justify sin in your life all things are lawful for me but not all things are helpful we have to ask ourselves this question are, are we struggling with sin do we find ourselves trying to just justify sin in our own lives i want to give you five basic things that i think you can do to help fight against the wrong idea of freedom and liberty and pursue what God wants for you. 
first one, Romans, is found in Romans chapter 6, verse 15. It says, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? Notice Paul's response there. By no means. See, Paul's making it clear that a true Christian's heart would not be one that desires to sin, but would want to run from sin and not just excuse it or justify it. Paul says, by no means. Paul's saying that our Christian liberty should never leave us feeling like our sin is okay because we're saved. By no means, he says. So I would encourage you to make every effort to run from sin. Here's the next verse that will help you. Philippians 3. Verse 12 says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What is he saying here? Paul's saying, press on towards holiness. Not just live in the same old standard life that you've been living, but to pursue holiness. What what is he saying there? You're no longer bound by those sins in the past. So, So press on with a new aim, a new focus. And what is that focus that he tells us to look to? It's heaven. So press on towards that goal, to that. That is the focus that pleases the Lord. Here's a third verse that I think will help you. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who have believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Bible says you will know the truth. I love the promise that's in this text right here. That if we abide in Christ, that he will reveal his truth to us. And if, if we are abiding in him and he's revealing his truth to us, then we will truly understand what that promise says. And that is it will set us free. We will understand what that freedom is. That freedom is not a call to continue to sin, but a freedom to pursue holiness. See, I don't believe the gospel gives us the truth that it allows us to go on and sinning. I believe the gospel is calling us to abide in the word of God. And our freedom will be used in the way that it was intended. And that is to glorify God. Here's another verse. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a verse that's very personal to me. My life verse. Because it says if we really want to be Christ's disciples, we must take up our own cross. And follow Jesus. Where did Jesus go? He went to a hill. Where he would be nailed to that cross. And then he would be lifted up. And he would die on that cross. And Luke's telling us that if we want to. Jesus is saying to Luke. If we want to be his disciples. We must carry our cross to him. It means that we bring our sin to him. And we get up from there. And we leave it there. Jesus is the one that pays the price for us, but we are responsible, if we're going to be his disciples, to carry our cross to Jesus. How do we do it? Deny ourselves. We have to deny our pleasures, our sensual pleasures, our selfish desires that lead us to sin on a daily basis, and we must follow him. Listen, I'm here to tell you, and and I know it sounds legalistic, but it's the truth. Jesus died for the church. And in Hebrews, he tells us that we should not forsake the assembling together of believers. And there's a reason in that. Because all it takes is just one or two days of getting away from the Lord and you find yourself in a bad place. Luke 9 says, follow him daily. So there's our challenge. The Greeks, they had it wrong. It's not a green card for them to go on sinning, get out of jail free, or do whatever they wanted. No, the freedom and the liberty that they were experiencing in God was, was simply this. It, was a, it should have been a greater expectation for them. Uh, they should have had a higher calling than just deciding to, okay, well, we can continue to do this. You see, freedom. Get the proper definition of freedom. Freedom is the pursuit of doing what Christ has called you to do. That is freedom. We chose destruction. 
God chose restoration. So freedom is the pursuit of Christ and what he wants, not what I want. So I want you to remind you to underline it, highlight it, do whatever you got to do to get to the truth of this but, because it is a small yet powerful word. And if we will pay attention to that small word, sometimes it will sure keep us out of a lot of destruction, won't it? It'll keep us from making bad decisions and keep us on the right path with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now listen, here's the second thing I want you to see. We see it in verses 15 through 18, is we need to recognize whose you are. The Bible says that when we got saved, that we became united. We became one with Christ. We were adopted into his family. Our last name changed. Look at verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We are one with Christ. And so Paul wants everyone, he's, he's writing this to the Greeks at this point in time, but, but his writing is true to us today, that he wants everyone to know that they are, need to recognize this truth, that they are his. They're one with Christ. See, in the verse before that, in verse 13, the section before that, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. The reason Paul throws that in there is because here's what the Greeks thought. The Greeks thought that, well, we, we have to eat to survive. And so if we have to eat to keep the body alive, and that's what it's meant for, and food tastes good and we can enjoy food, well, then sexual desires are of the flesh and of the body, and so we should be able to partake of the same thing. That was their reasoning. And so Paul's trying to say, no, these two aren't the same. He actually says that, that the stomach and the food will die. It'll be gone. But you are united with Christ. You are his. So this is what he's trying to do to get these Greeks to understand that this is not the same type of mentality here. And so Paul makes it clear that this is sin. That this lifestyle they were living was sinful and that sexual immorality was a deep issue. Because here's what he's saying. And we hear this a lot at, at weddings. But here's what he's saying. Is the Holy Spirit and, and, and you are one. Then anytime there's sexual immoral immorality that happens, you are bringing the Lord along with you. And that that sin is, is greater. Because you're involving Christ in your sin. Paul wants them to understand this is a significant issue. Because they bring Jesus with them. So we need to recognize who we are. That we are one with Christ. John 17. Jesus is talking with the Lord. And in verse 21 he says that. They may all be one just as you father are in me. And I in you that they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. We are one with Christ. Do you understand how we're made one with him? It's by grace our faith because grace is us getting something that we don't deserve so we are one with him ephesians 2 verses 4 says but god being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in christ jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of the grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We are united. We are one with God. But can I tell you another thing? Do you realize that you are resurrected? Now, now hear me out. Ephesians, or Romans 8, verse 6 says this, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, who, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a great promise. 
you have this promise that one day your body will be resurrected. Like Christ was resurrected, you too will be resurrected. I had a situation at Sherry's mom's funeral not too long ago. I preached at a funeral, and one of her, one of her family members came to me and said, Hey, Pastor, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, Yes. And he said, hey, my, my mother was cremated, and I'm, I'm just curious about this. And it led me to the truth that if God could create life out of nothing, can he not create life out of ashes? And so we were able to have this great discussion. I won't go into all the details of it, of what got him to really think through it. But I just want you to understand that one day, no matter what happens to us on this earth when our bodies die, one day as believers, we too will be resurrected into a new glorified body so we can rest in that promise that we are already resurrected and so what do we do with this if we are united with him and one day we'll have a resurrected body as he has what do we do with this paul says in verse 18 flee from sexual immorality there's a story in the bible it's found in genesis and if you look at chapter 39 verse 12 says she caught him by his garment this is potiphar's wife saying lie with me but he left his garment in her head and fled and got out of the house you know the whole story. She then turns, decides to turn him in that he was trying to rape her. And, and Joseph gets thrown in jail, if you remember, for a long period of time. Listen, I'm, trying, I'm here to tell you that that's an example for us to follow. Even if it means you're going to look bad. Even if it means you might have to face some kind of jail time. It, whatever it might mean. If you know the right thing to do is to flee the immorality, flee it. It would have been easy for Joseph to just stay and do what he didn't want to do, but he made a decision that he was not going to dishonor his body. And so he spent many years in prison. He did the right thing. So flee immorality. Here's the other thing that I want to encourage you to do. Protect your name. We have a responsibility to protect our name. Proverbs 22 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Your name as a believer is the greatest treasure you have. You are one with Christ. You have his name, so protect it. And I think thirdly, uh, desire purity. Desire purity. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart and renew a spirit within me. We should desire that. We should have a desire based on what Christ did for us on that cross that that ought to be our heart is that we constantly ask the Lord to clean our heart, to create in us a clean heart, to renew a right spirit in me, to keep me on the right path, to guide me in the way in which he wants to go. Because listen, if we desire this, his promise is that he will. He will guide us. He will protect us. But we must desire it. And so once we are able to identify whose we are, that we are Christ. I think the third thing we do is we surrender to what you are. You need to surrender to what you are. We find this in verses 19 through 20. Verse 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. It is your deposit that is given to you by God, guaranteeing your eternal salvation. God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that our body is the temple. And yet how many times, let's just be honest, church, how many times do we run around acting like and living like we don't have the Holy Spirit with us? Like, like he's not even there. And yet, he's there. And so I want to challenge us today that for us to be able to identify that we are united with God, but that we're also the temple of the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit to us? This is, why, this is what I think is important for us to be able to live this out in our life. We have to ask ourselves, who is the Holy Spirit to us? This is one area in which I believe this, the Baptist church does not do a good enough job is teaching on the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to give you a few things today. I'm not going to go into a whole uh, doctoral thesis, if you will, on the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to give you a few things today that I think is important for us to understand on who the Holy Spirit is. Number one, He is our guide. Galatians 5, starting verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The Holy Spirit is our God. If you have truly accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, He has deposited within you the Holy Spirit to help guide you and convict you from giving in to the flesh. We know that the flesh is going to desire sin. But He promises that if we have accepted Him, He's going to give us this and He's going to be our God. Here's another thing that I want you to know. And I'm going to use a word here that some of you might, might be a little like, oh, hold on now. But, but listen, hear, hear me out. Do you realize this, that when we have the Holy Spirit, we're possessed by Him? 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of the darkness into this marvelous light. One of the scariest classes I took in seminary was a spiritual warfare class. And I'm just going to tell you that I'm thankful that as believers, God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. Because here's the truth. You cannot have both an evil spirit and the Holy Spirit living in the same temple. Now you can be oppressed, and many of you Christians out there have, have the Holy Spirit living in you, and you're oppressed, you feel the pressures of Satan, but here's what you can't have based on God's promise right there that you are his own possession, that if the Holy Spirit lives in you, you don't have to worry about demonic possession. Because according to the Bible, you are his, and he has protected you, he is your guide, and he is the one that is possessing you. And so Christians cannot be possessed by an evil spirit if you're full with the Holy Spirit. And so he is our God, and we are possessed by him. And so there are some things then that if he is living with us and he is doing things for us, there are some things that we're obligated to do. And here they are. Number one, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen, every day when we get up, we need to be mindful of him. We need to realize and recognize that he is with us. Because he's with us, we shouldn't unite or be full of sin. Ephesians 5.15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Listen, church, your walk matters. Your walk matters. Why does your Christian walk matter? Because, listen, the Bible teaches us that there are people watching. There is a lost and dying world that is watching what we as the church do. And we should walk as Christ walked. We should live as Christ lived. We should love as Christ loved. And so I ask the question, do you live out your life in a way that reflects what you say your heart believes? That is a deep question. Do you live out your life in a way that reflects what your heart, what you say your heart believes? So don't unite or be full of sin. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Also this, the Holy Spirit helps us be patient. Anybody have any problems with patience? Y'all don't look at my wife. Is she staring at me right now? Galatians 5.15, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Do you realize that this is the number one problem in the church? We as Christians eat our own, don't we? We eat our own, and yet we have the same mission, the same gospel, the same purpose, and yet we eat our own. When the truth of the matter is, is we're called to encourage each other. We're called to lift each other up. And so that means we're to be patient with each other. The Holy Spirit also allows us to walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, the Holy Spirit is our light. He is the one that directs our path so that, catch this, Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Pastor Gary, I think you hit on Matthew 5 last week. We're to let it shine. The Holy Spirit's going to guide us in this light so that it can be seen and give glory by lost people. Catch that to our Father who is in heaven. Walk in the light. 
Why do we do all this? Why are we so sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Why are we trying to recognize who he is and that he's our guide and that, and that, and that, he, he, that he indwells us and that we are his temple? Why do we do all of this? Because we were ransomed. We are ransomed people. First Peter 1, verse 18. I know I'm filling you with a lot of scripture today, but I really want you to get this idea. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. I told you earlier, the gospel is not a one-time event. It is a lifelong decision. And this is what Paul is speaking about. If you back up into verse 11, what Pastor Gary finished with, and here it is, I want you to go ahead and get your pens back out, because guess what? There's another three-letter word in here. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's the gospel. That you were once a sinner apart from God, but you, you, when you made a decision to accept Christ, you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified. You mean you know what that tells me? That tells me no matter how hard I work or what I think I have to do to be able to approach a holy God, I will never come clean enough. Because even when I get there, guess what it says? I still have to be washed. And it is only through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that you and I can be washed. And when he washes us, and when he makes us clean, and when we are working through this sanctification process, we are made new. And it is the gospel. That's why we preach it so much around here. Because it is the gospel that will carry you to the end of the days. And so you were ransomed. Here's the other promise. You will overcome. First John 5, sorry, verse 4. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? What a great promise. That by our faith, our confession through the work that Jesus did, we will overcome this dark, dreaded, sinful world. So I want to remind you what Paul is saying here. And the reason that I entitled this all, because I could have spent a lot of time today on sexual immorality. But can I be honest with you? There's a lot of sins <laughs> that fall in this camp. Paul's just addressing the one of that day that the Greeks were dealing with and how big of a deal that was. But listen, all sin keeps us and separates us from God. We all sin and we all foreshort of his glory. But listen, our pursuit should be that of holiness. We should be making a commitment. But he says, all things are lawful for me. That should never be the attitude of somebody who is a believer. That should never be our heart to justify sinful behavior. But all things are, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be not dominated by anything. Our lifestyle should be the after the but. That we should want to honor God, that we want to give God glory, not just justify our sinful lifestyles and continue to live as we've always lived. I would honestly tell you that I, I believe that if a consistent, ongoing lifestyle that is sinful would mean that you probably haven't met the same Jesus I've met. Now, maybe I don't struggle with the same sin that you struggled with, but I can tell you before I got saved, there were some certain sins that I struggled with. Alcohol being one of them. But I'm here to tell you I have no desire to drink another sip of alcohol in my life. Matter of fact, I would even go on, on point to tell you that I think that all alcohol is sinful today. You can debate me later about that if you want, but I bet you better bring your Bible because I've studied it. But I struggled with that. But I don't struggle with it anymore. And if I'm ever tempted by it, it's no problem. The Holy Spirit reminds me of something, and I'm like, yep, nope, no big deal. Don't need it ongoing sinful lifestyle i think you need to ask yourself do you truly know jesus listen i'm gonna close it this way jesus didn't go halfway to the cross 
Jesus didn't just walk a quarter way to the cross. Jesus went all the way to Golgotha, where he was nailed to a cross, naked, lifted up. And what did he holler? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm here to tell you that if that's the salvation that you've experienced and you understand the cost that it cost God in order for him to save you, then I think that you can't be on the fence, church. You can't be partially in thinking it's good enough that, oh, I went to church on Sunday. I listened to Christian music. I prayed. No, listen, that is not what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. The Holy Spirit, if we have accepted him, is leading us to be all in to God, to be an all in to the pursuit of God. Holiness. Why? Because God wants the best for you. And listen, I'm here to tell you that the last time I checked, and you would agree with this statement, that sin does nothing but destroy you. And God wants the best for you. So will you make that decision today? Maybe some of you, as our worship team comes back up, maybe some of you are in the room today and you're saying, you know, Pastor, I'm not all in. All to Jesus I surrender. Can you say that today, that you have surrendered all to Jesus? If somebody was to come to you that knows about sin in your life and confront you on it, would you say, you know what, that was me, but now it's not me? Would you be able to say that? Maybe today God's calling you back. Maybe you have been saved and you've walked away from Jesus. And maybe he's calling you to just come back and repent and to be back all in. For some of you, maybe you were like me for a long part of your life and you thought, well, I'm good. I know who Jesus is. But maybe you're feeling now that Holy Spirit conviction that you're not all in. It's just playing a game. That's not what God wants. God doesn't want you dominated by sin. God wants to bless you. And I'm just here to tell you, I don't regret giving up any of that sinful stuff. Not one time do I regret giving up anything that I have come to realize through God's word that it was sinful. The Holy Spirit has replaced it with something of much greater value and of much greater joy. And that is what I would want for you. That is what the Lord wants for you. And so what is your decision that you need to make today? I'm going to pray. And when I do, you come. Pastor Gary will be down here. There will be others down here maybe to talk with you answer questions you may have, be able to set up a time, maybe we can follow up with you and have a meeting with you. Maybe you just want to come and rededicate your life and repent and say, God, I I thought I was all in, but I haven't been all in. There's a few things that I want to give up to you today. And you can just come and you can talk to Pastor Gary. You can kneel at this altar. Maybe there are people that you know need to be all in. I believe we need to pray for those people. I believe God is a good God, a gracious God, a loving God. Listen, I I think the number one thing we can do for people that we know need Jesus is pray for them. Because the prayers of the righteous avail as much. So maybe you know some people that need this freedom, the true liberty found in Christ. You can come to the altars and pray. You don't have to be a member of this church to come and pray. Just come. Join me in prayer now. God, we thank you for this day. What a tough text, God. But it's in your word. And it's a text that we must preach in your full counsel. So God, sometimes we run around in this world and in this life and we justify our sinful behavior. We justify our things that we struggle with, things that dominate us, things that control us because we willfully continue to give in to them. But God, you have said that they're not helpful for us. And so God, I pray today that our hearts would be renewed, that our minds would be clear, that that lives would be brought back to you, that salvation would occur, that repentance would occur, and that moving forward, God, we would be a church, we would be individuals who live in a way that pursues holiness. Because God, our world is watching. They're watching how we live. So God, I pray that we wouldn't be a judgmental group, but we'd be a holy group that 
desires nothing more to see people come to know you. And so God, I pray for your Holy Spirit's movement now. I pray for your power to sweep over us. And whatever it is, whoever it is, God, I pray that you give us the conviction and the call and the push and the strength to answer what you're saying to us and what you're doing for us. And so God, I only have a few moments, but I pray, God, that these moments would be worshipful moments. Here we put our lives in yours. And that we trust you this day forward. We ask all this in Christ's name.